Hello, I'm Matthew Kahn. I'm a professor of economics, and I'm about to read to you uh, chapter one of my 2010 book, Climatopolis. Back in 2010, and in recent years, I continue to be very interested in the microeconomics of adapting to climate change. Uh, back in 2010, I published this book, great cover. I ran into the issue that uh, my publisher, we chose the subtitle, How Our Cities Will Thrive in the Hotter Future. And the word thrive um, triggered uh, some criticism of this book by people who didn't even bother to read it. Um, the word thrive can breed complacency and it can breed um, a lulling hypothesis. I had hoped uh, that the subtitle would be Climatopolis, the future of our cities in the hotter world. But uh, we went with the uh, riskier, uh, how our cities will thrive in the hotter world. And the word thrive um, caused some pushback. So permit me uh, to read chapter one to you and let's see what everyone thinks now that 11 years have passed. Chapter one is titled, Too Much Gas. Shanghai's growth over the last 30 years has been staggering. Measured in cars, concrete, new buildings, new homes, and air travel, this city has been transformed from an industrial hotbed of revolutionary leftism into one of the world's superstar cities. The neon-lit buildings along its Bund waterfront feature five-star hotels, high-end restaurants such as John George, enough in quality and quantity to compete with any other world-class city from New York to Paris. The rise of this megacity foreshadows China's trajectory in the 21st century and that of the rest of the world. Hundreds of millions will be moving to cities like Shanghai to strike it rich and escape the rural life as more and more of the world's population continues the shift that's been going on in fits and starts since the Industrial Revolution, moving from the rural to the urban. By 1950, 30% of the world's population lived in cities. In the year 2000, this portion grew to 47%, and the United Nations predicts it will rise to 60% by 2030. These would-be city dwellers want economic opportunities and material comforts that we take for granted. Cell phones and decent service, personal computers, access to private transportation, and household air conditioning. Given this search for the good life and the amenities that go with it, the move towards urban life makes sense. Cities are capitalism's growth engine, offering opportunity along every dimension, from finding a job to supporting oneself, to finding a mate to spend money on, to great cultural events to attend, to fantastic restaurants of all kinds. And maybe a bit later, parks to take the kids to. City growth has lifted billions of people out of poverty. That's a good thing although many lament the loss of agricultural and pastoral life. But how many of those who bemoan the loss of farm living have gotten up before sunrise to milk cows by hand or slop pigs or pitch hay? I haven't, but I'm pretty sure it wouldn't be much fun. Day after day, if you don't believe me, contrast Seinfeld's life in New York City with the cheery world of Swiss Family Robinson. Prominent writers such as Jared Diamond, author of the bestseller Guns, Germs, and Steel, and the more foreboding collapse are deeply worried about the environmental consequences of the growth of the middle class in the developing world. Diamond and most environmentalists charge capitalism with causing climate change because urban growth provides us with the income to afford a Hummer and a big house. Capitalist growth, they say, perpetuates itself with an advertising and consumer oriented culture, i.e. the American dream that manipulates our desires to consume more and more carbon intensive stuff, lawnmowers, air conditioners, cars, car seats, disposable diapers, and so on. Recent macroeconomic trends support some of these claims. The world's population, per capita income, and greenhouse gas emissions are all rising. The world's population will have grown from 2.6 billion in the year 1950 to 6.9 billion by the year 2010. Real world per capita income is now at 7,400 US dollars, a figure that has grown sharply over the last 40 years. In 2005, the world produced 28.1 billion metric tons of carbon dioxide. That number is predicted to rise to 42.3 billion metric tons per year by the year 2030. That's a lot of carbon dioxide. 
Leading climate change researchers have concluded that to protect the planet from potentially catastrophic climate change risk, we must stabilize atmospheric carbon dioxide concentration at 500 parts per million, or even as low as 350 parts per million. But this would require reducing our total global carbon dioxide emissions to no more than 19.1 billion tons per year, a little less than half of what's predicted for 2030. In a world with 7 billion people, the world's current population, we would have to shrink our carbon emissions to an average of about two and a half tons per person per year. To put this in perspective, a car that gets about 25 miles to the gallon, say a Toyota Corolla, would exceed the 2.5 ton target at 7,500 miles per year. The average driver travels something like 12,000 miles a year. But driving is not our sole source of greenhouse gas emissions. When we turn on the lights, eat a steak, order a coffee, take a shower, send an email, and do countless other things during the day, they all result in extra greenhouse gas emissions. Are you ready to cut back? If so, are you willing to cut back that much? If you answered yes, you're probably kidding yourself. Evidence shows that very few individuals have cut back on their carbon producing activities at all. Most of us are free riders, hoping someone else will do the heavy lifting so we don't have to. The fundamental free rider problem is that each of us hopes that everyone else will cut back and allow us to keep hummering or corollaing along, which is to say that attempts to reduce or reverse our carbon output to mitigate the damage we've already done aren't going so well. We're a bit like the Titanic on the night of April 14th, 1912. We know how the Titanic story ends, but suppose the ship's watchman had seen the iceberg out in the distance. Anticipating that bad things happen when a ship hits such a big piece of ice, he would have issued a warning to the navigator to change course and the disaster would have been averted. Climate change and hitting an iceberg are different events to be sure. In the case of the iceberg, the consequences of the ship hitting the ice are obvious and immediate. No Rush Limbaugh could step in and say that angry liberal, liberals are the real source of the problem. All aboard the Titanic would agree that they would have a big, huge problem if they hit the iceberg. Nobody on board would say, well, that will only hurt the people in third class, and I never liked them anyway. The Titanic did not have enough lifeboats for everyone. Even the rich could not be sure that they would escape alive if a collision took place. Once those on board the Titanic spotted the iceberg, everyone would agree that switching direction to avoid it would be a wiser move. The crew and passengers would know that they would immediately be victims and all go down together. In contrast, as climate scientists demand that we take costly action to reduce global carbon dioxide concentrations to as low as 350 parts per million, Many people do not see why we should do so, even though we can see the iceberg. We know what the future our iceberg looks like, almost guaranteed. More people, more money per person, and more overall pollution. And that's our starting point in this book. We've already released too much greenhouse gas, and I see no credible signs that global emissions will decline in the near or medium future. Although the carbon mitigation agenda, the plan to reduce our emissions, is a worthy goal, we're unlikely to invent a magical new clean technology that allows us to live well without producing greenhouse gas emissions. We're equally unlikely to devise a geoengineering technological fix that vacuums up the world's carbon emissions. That is, unlike a ship, we can't turn away. So if the world's gonna be hotter and if more of the world's population is going to be living in cities, then the fundamental question is what the future of cities will be in our hotter world. Some claim that our future is bleak. The 2008 Nobel laureate in economics, Paul Krugerman, for instance, has argued that we are like a frog in a pot of slowly heating water, patiently waiting to be cooked when it comes to boil. He laments that although he knows the climate pot is getting hotter, we frogs are blissfully ignorant of the coming doom that climate change will cause. It's worth noting, though, that frogs do actually jump out of heating water. They don't sit around waiting to get cooked, and neither will we. I'm optimistic about the quality of our lives in the cities of the future, despite the very different climate conditions that we'll face. Urban life will go on in our hotter world. At the heart of my belief that we frogs won't cook is our individual freedom of choice, not to mitigate, but to adapt. Unlike birds and butterflies, we have a much wider variety of choices and options 
that allow us to protect ourselves from climate change. This personal freedom opens up pathways that will greatly help urbanites cope with it. As climate change unfolds, billions of households will seek out strategies for protecting their families from harm. Some will move to higher ground, to areas that are unlikely to flood. Others will seek out products ranging from energy efficient air conditioning to higher quality building materials to protect themselves from climate change blows. My vision that we will save ourselves by adapting to our ever changing circumstances stands in sharp contrast to the usual Hollywood theme of a singular hero such as an Arnold or a Harrison or even Sly saving us from Armageddon. Of course, a bunch of people acting rationally in response to a slowly changing world won't make for a really action-packed thriller. We're not all on board one big ship that we can save through one collective decision. Instead, we'll be, quote, saved by a multitude of self-interested people armed only with their wits and access to capitalist markets. In that way, my core theme is ironic. Capitalist growth created the problem of mass greenhouse gases, but now capitalism's dynamism and its ability to reinvent itself will help us to adapt to the climate challenges we have created. So how will this work? Over the last 20 years, I've lived in Chicago, New York City, Boston, and Los Angeles. While I've sought out good job opportunities and the possibility of living in the same city as my wife, I also always sought cities that I thought offered a high quality of life. Put bluntly, I won't move to a city that doesn't have it. And I'm not alone. Cities compete with one another, although we don't normally think of them as doing so, unless they're vying to host the Olympic Games. But they do. Climate change will affect the competitive landscape for cities, and people will be able to choose the winner by voting with their feet. Around the world, cities are starting from different points in the race to adapt to climate change. Salt Lake City is unlikely to flood. New York City can. Moscow is unlikely to suffer from extreme heat waves. Phoenix will. The geographic location of cities helps to define the diverse challenges they will face. Part of the challenge in predicting how cities will adapt to climate change is recognizing the diversity of cities that exist. Some are coastal, some are tropical, some are rich, and some are poor. Some are located in democracies, while others are in dictatorships. In this book, I seek to explain how all of these factors will affect the quality of urban life in the hotter world. As climate change heats up our cities, it will create enormous demand for new products to protect people. Households that continue to live in a hotter Phoenix will seek out new architectural designs for homes, windows, and more energy efficient air conditioning to protect them from the summer heat. This is just the tip of the iceberg. Such anticipated demand creates opportunities for green entrepreneurs to step in and innovate, as well as serious competition as they fight with one another for market share. In this competition to seize the adaptation market, many of these ideas will fall flat, but the next green Google is sure to emerge. Such efforts strengthen our cumulative ability to withstand climate change. Some worry that the resource scarcity caused by climate change will lead to war, but it's equally likely, and I believe more so, that the common risks we face will foster innovation that will protect all of us. Once these new products are developed, they'll be relatively easy to mass produce and sell around the world. The technologies that emerge can be diffused worldwide. Whether it's Twitter or solar panels or Tesla electric vehicles, the innovative capitalist culture will allow us to make a Houdini-style escape from climate change's most devastating impacts. Describing our environmental future is risky business. In 1968, Paul Ehrlich famously predicted in his bestseller Population Bomb that mass starvation would occur in the 1980s. He was wrong. At a lecture he gave at Stanford University, I heard him explain that his predictions did not come true because people read his book and adapted, and thus were able to avert disaster. I don't harbor the illusion that so many people will read this book that it will shift the course of history, but then they don't need to. My economics training has taught me the role that expectations and incentives play in changing people's behavior. If we get those right, we don't have to worry about doomsday scenarios because we will adapt. I recognize that my optimism may be viewed as audacious given our collective sleepy efforts to tackle, and in some cases even to acknowledge climate change up to this point. During this time of war and economic uncertainty, climate adaptation is a back burner issue. Despite Al Gore's efforts in futuristic Hollywood movies sketching out our scary future, 
such as the day after tomorrow, we are off to a slow start in preparing for the coming climate change. There are several possible explanations for this. First, we may be skeptics who like to laugh at chicken littles who announce that the sky is falling. We need to see climate change to believe it. Al Gore's PowerPoints show may not be sufficient truth. A few hot summers may not be sufficient proof. Second, we may anticipate the threat, but be technological optimists who trust our nerdy engineers to dream up some technological geoengineering fix if and when the time comes. Third, we may be impatient and lacking in imagination. Although we love our grandchildren, we think back to our grandparents and realize how much better our standard of living has been relative to theirs. We can foresee a similar generational progress for our grandkids. Perhaps they will hop a space shuttle to Mars. In the case of climate change, there are huge uncertainties about what the climate consequences of filling the atmosphere with greater carbon levels are. Such atmospheric carbon concentrations could cause horrible temperature changes. The probability of these events is not small. Put bluntly, if the world's greenhouse gas emissions continues to rise to a level of 600 parts per million, there's a non-negligible chance that the world's average temperature could increase by 10 degrees Fahrenheit. There could be an abrupt melting of Greenland's ice sheet and a collapse of West Antarctica's ice sheet. These events would have dramatic impacts on sea level. But we do know that we don't know for sure what these consequences will be. How do we respond to such known unknowns? There's two schools of thought in modern economics. The rising school of behavioral economics views us as a group of belly scratching Homer Simpsons who like in the frog in the hot pot simply say, go. Oh. Behavioral economists have a fundamentally pessimistic view of humans as lazy and myopic and unwilling to sacrifice for their long-term good. Whereas traditional economic man was a cold, calculating, self-interested individual, think of Mr. Spock from Star Trek, the new economic man is emotional, distracted, and sometimes illogical, think of Dr. McCoy from Star Trek. In a recent review in The New Yorker of two books written by behavioral scholars, Elizabeth Colbert celebrated this refreshing change in the zeitgeist of modern e economic research. Quote, who wants a friend or a lover who's too precise a calculator? This quote may explain why so many economists, like me, marry other economists. In contrast, neoclassical economists view people as forward-looking and willing to make choices today in response to anticipated threats. Such rational expectations in the face of known unknowns push the population to take proactive steps. The awareness of scary future scenarios provides the rational man with a head start in coping with climate change. For generations, University of Chicago economists, from Nobel laureate Milton Friedman to his student Nobel laureate Gary Becker to his non-Nobel laureate student, me, have believed that people respond to incentives as they pursue their life goals. Individuals have every incentive to recognize when they're in, in an unfamiliar situation. In this case, we will invest in better information that helps to reduce the uncertainty. As our climate scientists learn more and more about the challenges we face, this information provides us with an early warning system, signaling us about what lies ahead. This information helps us to cope with change. Returning to the frog in the hot pot analogy, suppose that Al Gore and Homer Simpson are both offered the opportunity to buy a home at a low price in an area that climate change scientists believe is at high risk for serious flooding. The Al Gores would either say no thanks or if they accepted this offer, would take steps such as elevating the home and other costly flood-proofing actions to protect it. Homer would be blissfully unaware and would seize the purchase opportunity. Such complacent households might actually migrate from safe cities such as a Salt Lake City to risky, beautiful cities such as a New York City if they trust government and engineers to invent a credible protection strategy. As more of these households move to such a city, their political cloud increases, and they attract even more federal government funds for protection. Once such households have made their locational decisions and chosen what types of homes to live in, Mother Nature will either create a nasty flood or not. There's a high probability that no storm will take place, even in the face of climate change. In this case, Homer Simpson will live on as a happy man. If a terrible flood does take place, Homer will suffer and Al Gore will not. A Darwinist would say that the Al Gores will have to repopulate the planet after the days of reckoning begin. But don't count out Homer. 
forward-looking entrepreneurs who smell the profit they could earn off the desperate homers will be ready with a variety of products to help the homers cope with their new reality. At the end of the day, the story will have a happy ending. Some urban places suffer, but urbanites continue. In a very different context, William Winston Churchill said, never in the field of human conflict was so much owed by so many to so few. That quote also applies in the case of climate adaptation. A small cadre of forward-looking entrepreneurs will be ready to get rich selling the next generation of products that will help us all to adapt. It has happened before. Whenever we humans have been confronted by disaster, we've recovered, even from some really big ones. Chapter two discusses some of these events and the lessons we can learn from them, which we can apply to living in our hotter future. So I wrote this 11 years ago, and this was targeted for a general audience, and some of the jokes are not that funny. But the same ideas about thinking through incentives and anticipation continue to be very important today. And this question of how different economic agents respond to information, depending on their risk aversion and their information, um, with the exception of a few bad jokes there, I think that this uh, chapter is strong. I realize that this is a time where people care deeply about income inequality. And my suggestion, I believe that, uh, that there will be a growth. The next Jeff Bezos is the next Elon Musk. When there is a large market, there is a great incentive to step in and to innovate. So there's an interesting issue of how we create this new generation of products to fuel our adaptation. But look at everything from the cell phone to color televisions. Products become cheaper and cheaper over time. So um, while billionaire fortunes will be earned by creating climate adaptation products, don't view these products as elitist. Uh, we have seen throughout the world uh, cell phone diffusion around the world and the private sector producing cheaper and higher quality products and that this uh, fuels uh, the growth of firms. And this is Adam Smith's invisible hand at work as sellers have a profit incentive to create those products that people demand. And these products help to enhance our safety. Uh, so I continue to like Climatopolis more than many of my reviewers. <laughs>